topic is uh, body as a living sacrifice. On Tuesday, the focus was on reverent fear, a holy fear. Uh, the Bible talks about a holy fear. Uh, holy means set apart, a different kind of fear, a fear of God, which is very reverential. And we are inspired to fear God. And uh, in, while speaking on that, I told about the motivation for us to fear God reverently. Not the fear of punishment of God, but the blessings of God. How God blesses us. And according to Jeremiah 32nd chapter, verse 40, he inspires us to fear him. And we spoke about six motivations. Uh, the love of God. 1 John 419, we love because he first loved us. Loving God is to obey him. Number two, the grace of God, which motivates us to say no to sin. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 onwards. Number three, the kindness of God, Romans 2, 4. Number four, the kingdom of God, Hebrews 12, 28. Number five, the promise of God, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. And the mercy of God. And today I'm going to elaborate upon that. Uh, Romans 12, 1 says, Brothers, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is a spiritual act of worship. Spiritual worship is obedience. Obedience. And uh, worship, what, what worship basically means bowing down. Spiritually bowing down means obeying Him, putting in our own desires and replacing with God's desires. And the motivation for that is the mercy of God. Because of God's mercy, as a result of God's most mercy, in response to God's mercy, offer bodies as living sacrifices. How do you practically offer a body as a living sacrifice? The body has many parts. The body responds to the stimulus in this world. There are five senses. Sense of sight, sense of hearing, sense of taste, sense of touch, a sense of smell. To, to do with the eyes, the ears, the mouth, the nose and the hands. This is part of the body. And with these five senses, we tend to get attracted to the sin in this world. And practically offering body living sacrifice means every part of our body which you earlier offer to sin, we offer to God. The practical application of Romans 12 1 is specified in Romans chapter 6, verse 13. The Paul writes, do not offer the parts of body to sin as instruments of wickedness. But those who have been brought from death to life, offer the parts of body to him as instruments of righteousness. Every part of our body which earlier offered to the world and to sin, now we offer to God to be used by him for his glory. The body is a very troublesome part. We can give a heart to God a mind to God, but the body, we have to overcome our body's stimulus to the world. As Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 9.27, I beat my body and make it my slave. After I preach others, I won't be disqualified for the price. Different parts of the body tend to get attracted to the stimulus in the world, to the sin in this world. The devil entices us through things in this world. Now, through the cross, we all have been rescued from the evil one. We are now in the kingdom of God, all of us. And uh, in Colossians chapter 1, 13, 14, Paul writes, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and has brought us to the kingdom of the Son he loves. In the redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Kingdom of God is power. And by the power of God, we will enjoy this new uh, life we have. We can enjoy the kingdom of God. And we can live for the Lord while living in a wicked world. We've been rescued from the evil one. But Paul wrote that. But then he has some other problem he had. The body. He had a problem with the body. He says, what I want to do, not able to do. What I don't want to do, I'm doing. What a wretched man I am. This found in the book of Romans. 
seventh chapter, the last few verses. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Problem is not with the devil. We have come victory over the devil, you've been given. We have been given victory over the devil. Our problem is with the body. The body has various uh, faculties that tend to be attracted to things of this world. And devil entices us, entices us, appealing to the sinful nature which resides in our bodies. So I'm going to take some of the parts of the body tonight and talk about how we can have victory over, over these uh, different parts of the body and live a victorious life. Take the eye, for example. Eye. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 and 23, uh, Jesus said, The eye is the lamp of the body. When the eye is a good, whole body is full of light. When the eye is a bad, whole body is full of darkness. If then the light within is darkness, how great is the darkness? So the eye is a lamp of the body. The eye is a good whole body is full of light. So what we see, we process in our minds. From the mind, that goes into our hearts, into our spirits. That's why in the Old Testament, we read in Psalm 119, 36-37, we read, where the psalmist writes, Turn my heart towards your statutes and not towards selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to what? Turn my eyes away from worthless things. When you keep on looking at something which is not good for our spiritual growth, keep on looking at it. From the eyesight, it goes into the mind, we think about it. And from the mind, it corrupts the heart. The mind processes what the eye sees, and the years here, to give an example, practically. So God says to his people in Jeremiah 4.14, O Jerusalem, wash the sin from your heart and be saved. How long will you harbor wicked thoughts? With their eyes, be covet. With their eyes, be lust. What's the meaning of the word lust? Very practically put, lust is desiring something forbidden. Desiring something forbidden is lust. It doesn't necessarily mean to do the opposite sex. Usually we are connected with the opposite sex. We look at a woman lustfully. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 5.28, in talking about adultery, he says, if you look lustfully at a woman, you come to adultery in your heart. If you look lustfully at a woman, you come to adultery in your heart. In your heart, not a physical adultery. Looking lustfully, wanting to have her when she belongs to somebody else or she doesn't belong to you, then you look at her, then you come adultery in the heart. Because what you see affects the mind, or the mind it goes into the heart. Peter wrote about certain people in 2 Peter 2:14, with eyes of adultery, they never stop sinning. With eyes of adultery, they never stop sinning. Eyes of adultery, not the heart of adultery. From the eyes goes to the heart. Not a physical adultery. Eyes of adultery. Now, we, when you live in this world, we can't but uh, see people around us who look attractive. If I were to walk on the road and 50% of the population of the opposite sex, I can't close my eyes and walk, right? But I shouldn't have eyes of adultery. I should have eyes of purity. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 2, Peter writes about uh, I'm sorry, First Timothy, First Timothy chapter five verse two. Paul writes about treat uh, younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Treat younger women as sisters with absolute purity. You can have eyes of purity or eyes of adultery. You can't close your eyes and walk on the road, isn't it? So the question: How you look at a person? And then Job himself, you know, God spoke about Job. Testified about Job, even to Satan. Have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Job chapter 1 verse 8. And this same Job writes in 31st chapter of Job, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a girl. I made a covenant, a decision with my eyes. His mind told the eye, look here. 
Don't look at Sodom women. The covenant. Never look at a girl with lust. It's possible to look at a woman without lust, with pure eyes. You can walk in the garden, see a wonderful rose flower, and not pluck it. No? You can appreciate it, but not pluck it. So you can look at a woman without lust, wanting to have her, but with the pure eyes. So how we look at situations very, very important. As I said, lust does not necessarily do the opposite sex. It has to do with desiring something forbidden. Now, I'm a diabetic. And uh, if I look at, I, used, I love ice cream, eating ice cream. Now, I can look at ice cream with that vanilla and that chocolate sauce on top and nuts on top and uh, look at it and want to have it. Desire to have it is forbidden. That's lust. Look at ice cream for a diabetic and wanting to have it is lust. Doesn't necessarily mean look at a woman and have lust in the eyes. So that's one aspect. So our eyes are very, very important. And uh, look at the connection between the eye and the heart in uh, uh, 100, Psalm 119, verses 36, 37. Turn my heart towards your statutes and not towards selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Again, we find both the eye and the heart. Uh, I'm going to, I quoted the 22nd, 23rd verse of uh, Matthew 6. I'm going to quote the previous verses also to get the context. From verse 19, uh, Jesus said to the people listening to him, when he delivered the Sermon on the Mount, Do not serve for self treasures on earth, the moth and dust destroy, thieves break and steal. We serve treasures in heaven, the moth and dust do not destroy, thieves don't break and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be. Next verse, the eye is the lamp of the body. When eyes are good, full body is full of light. When eyes are bad, full body is full of darkness. If then the light begins darkness, how great the darkness? We look at things of this world and focus on them with your physical eyes. Things of this world become your treasure and your heart will be where your treasure is. So very important what we see and how we see with adulterous eyes or pure eyes, lustful eyes or eyes of purity. And also the same eye we covet. Coveting is desiring something that someone else has which you don't have. And if you look at the book of James, in the first few verses it talks about, you don't have because you don't ask God and you ask, don't receive because ask wrong motives. Don't covet something that somebody else has when God doesn't want you to have. Once you to have, he'll give it to you. So don't neglect the role of the eye in what is going to go into your heart. But you keep on seeing, you think about, you keep on thinking about, and it's not right before God, then it'll contaminate the spirit. That's what the Bible says in Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart. It's a wellspring of life. From the heart, everything comes out. Wellspring of life. What goes in the heart goes from what you see as an example. So what we do is, we early we offer the eye to things of this world. And now the same eye we give to the Lord to use by him for his glory. Now we look at Jesus. Not with physical eyes, but with spiritual eyes. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Hebrews 12, 2. Fix your eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. Speaking our eyes on Jesus today basically means reading the four Gospels and studying the life of Jesus, how he responded to many situations in this world. We don't see him physically, but we'll look at his life and focus on his life. And also today he's at God's right hand, interceding for us. We call to have fellowship with him. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.9 says, God who called us into fellowship with the Son Jesus Christ Lord is faithful. So fix our eyes on him and uh, turn eyes away from worthless things. Sometimes people ask me, what's wrong if I look at something? I'm not doing anything wrong. I look at something. I only want to have it. I may not actually take it. But the point is this. In 1 Corinthians 6, 12, Paul writes, everything is permissible, everything is not beneficial. 
Everything is permissible, but I will not be mastered by anything. When you focus your eyes on things of this world, they become your treasure, your heart will be there, you can't, you, and you serve those things to get it. Whereas when eyes of a heart are enlightened and look at things of God, He will be our treasure. Our heart will be where God is. And therefore, we will serve God. So I, please give it to the Lord. Say, Lord, I used to look at all these things now. Now help me look at you, Lord. And also talk about some other things to end of the session I'm going to talk about. How sometimes people tell me, brother, can I always be reading the Bible only? After all, like I can't be reading the Bible all the time. I'm going to read the Bible all the time. 24 hours, I can't do that. I have to look at things of this world. What's wrong? I'll talk about that. What we're supposed to enjoy with our senses. I'll talk about what I do. And you consider it. Uh, yes, I know 24 hours we can't read the Bible. We look at the world and the eyes look at many things. How do we uh, set the eyes on things that please God? I'll talk about that to the end of the session. Let me now go from the eye to the ear. To the ear. Now, what we keep on hearing also affects our heart. What we keep on hearing affects the mind. The mind affects the heart. So while we give our eyes to the Lord and read the scriptures, look at Jesus, no more the world, no more the sin, but to God, specifically hand it over to God, our ears also we give to the Lord. Instead of hearing gossip, slander, malice, slanderous talk, start listening to God's word. Listen to God's word. And what we keep on hearing that's what ultimately we're going to speak. But we keep on hearing, will go into our heart. And from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 120, psalmist is David. Psalm 120 writes in verse 6 and 7, Too long have I lived among a people who hate peace. Too long have I lived among a people who hate peace. They love war. They hate peace. I am a man of peace, but when I speak, they are for war. So, he, although he's a man of peace, he says, kept on hearing war talk, not peace talk. The war talk went into the mind, into the heart. Ultimately, when he spoke, what did he speak? War talk. A man of peace speaking war talk. So, what company we keep is very important. First Corinthians. 1533, bad company corrupts good character. You may have a good character. We have bad company, but if people, people keep on talking all kinds of uh, gossip and slander and all that, then it corrupts your good character. And how often, if I, let's be honest about it, after a church service, if people go down to the basement or wherever and have coffee fellowship, whatever, can you imagine how many, what all they talk about? I'm not singling out any particular church. They talk about uh, what the, cost, the politics in the church, slander in the church, terrible things happen in the church, criticize people behind the back. Such things grieve the heart of God. What we speak grieves the heart of God. When we do something against the God's will, we speak loose talk. We grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30 says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. How do we grieve the Holy Spirit? By loose talk. Ephesians 4.30 said, don't grieve the Holy Spirit, who is in you. He is a witness to everything we see, we do. He is a, a hearer of everything we say. And verse 29 says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Only was for building up others, because it is meant for those who listen. So by speaking loose words, we grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, people talk these things. What about hearing? You may say, I don't speak gossip. I only listen to what people say, the problems they have. Now the problem is somebody, somebody else they're talking. Malice, slander, gossip. And he says in the Bible, in Proverbs 18.8, the words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go to the inner parts. They go to the inner parts. What is the inner part? The spirit of man, the heart of man. You're not a gossiping, but you're listening to gossip. No. As some people said, I heard juicy gossip today. Juicy gossip. Very juicy. I heard. I didn't speak gossip. I heard gossip. But that gossip is going to go into the inner parts. Once it's full of, inner part is full of that gossip, 
When you speak one day, you got to speak those very words. What you heard. Because Matthew 12, 34 says, from the abundant heart, the mouth speaks. The mouth speaks from the abundance of, the man, of a person's heart. But 35, the good man brings good things from the good sword up in his heart. The evil man brings evil things from evil stored up in his heart. So, what we speak is very, very important to understand. And what we hear is very important to understand. Because what we speak comes from what we keep on hearing. So we have to circumcise our ears. When Stephen testifies before uh, the, the Sanhedrin, in Acts 7, chapter 51, he says to the Sanhedrin, how these people, how? They have uncircumcised ears and hearts. Uncircumcised ears. They don't cut off what is not should not go into the ear. He said, you have to receive the Holy Spirit. Uncircumcised ears and hearts. Ear and heart. Your ear is uncircumcised. The heart is uncircumcised. So full of garbage. That's why we have garbage in our hearts. And as you all know, I've shared about so many times, I've shared about 14 different things in the heart of man, which you have to circumcise, remove. Matthew 5, 19. Jesus spoke about evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. Seven more things in Mark 7.22. Greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, arrogance, folly. So practically, when you used to listen to gossip and slander and evil talk, now turn your eyes away from your ears from that. Start listening to God's word. God's word cleanses. It heals. Psalm 107 verse 20. He sent forth his word and healed. In John 15, 3, Jesus says, You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. You are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. God's word cleanses. It sanctifies. In John 17, 17, Jesus said to the Father in heaven, prayed for the disciples. When he prayed in 17th chapter of John, he says there, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify means make holy. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. So when you keep on hearing God's word, it cleanses. Now it's quite possible that over the many years or whatever, we are used to certain kind of talk you're hearing. We see things and goes into the heart and heart is contaminated. But as you let God's word go deep into heart and mind, you will be a witness, a testimony to yourself about how God has removed all the garbage. He cleanses. You know, there's a, a saying in computer technology about uh, computer memory space. Last in, first out. Last in, first out. What a mem computer, me computer memory is stored with over a period of time. What comes in the last, first out. What is first there goes away. What comes last? Stays in. Very true of the uh, kingdom of God. When you keep on hearing God's word, all the garbage goes away. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit sanctify your spirit to the word. The word sanctifies, John 17, 17. The spirit sanctifies. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, Peter writes, The chosen of the of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the spirit, for obedience of Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood. Sprinkling by his blood. So give your eyes to the Lord. Lord, change my eyes. And let my eyes be fixed on you, your word, and take my eyes away from worthless things. Because what you keep on seeing is going to ultimately affect your spirit. Also give your ears to the Lord. But I want my ears to be tuned to your voice and not to gossip or slander or malice. Rather, your life-giving word, you send forth the word and heal. The word of God gives life. In John 63, 63, Jesus says, 
The flesh counts for nothing. The spirit gives life. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. So give your ears to the Lord. No more to the world, but to Jesus. That's why Jesus said, he who has ears, let him hear. He who has ears, let him hear. They all have ears, no? Physical ears they've got. But they don't listen to what God says. If you have heard, hear, listen to what I say. As Samuel told the Lord, when the Lord called him by name, speak, Lord, his servant is listening. I'm listening to you, Lord. So let us be a people who take a, make a decision to listen to God's word, listen to him. And put, while we do that, God's word goes in our hearts and minds, cleanses our hearts. So I hear. Third is the tongue. Very difficult, difficult part of the body. If you look at the third chapter of James, first 11 verses, later on you can read it, do it as a homework. We've got a whole week free next week. So take some time to, what I'm going to suggest now is after today's message, you know, next week, meditate upon every part of your body. Your eye, your ear, your mouth, your sense of touch, and uh, your sense of hearing, of course, sense of smell, of course, doesn't apply to the kingdom of God. Uh, I'll talk about that later. How, what, how we use our, our sense of smell. And to end, I'm going to speak about that. And uh, ask God, Lord, which is my problem, Lord? And I tell you, most of us have a problem with the tongue. Uh, James writes, Man can tame every animal, bird, reptile. But no man can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. What a description. Restless evil. You can't keep quiet without doing evil. If you're not doing evil, restless. Has to say something bad. Man's uh, naturally, a man's tongue is like that. The entire eleventh chapter, uh, third chapter of James, verse one to eleven, talks about that. A big ship is controlled by a small rudder. A big horse is controlled by a bit, a, a, a bridle. A forest fire is set on fire. A forest set on fire to a small spark. Something very small controls something very big. The tongue is a small part of the body. Corrupts the whole person. The whole course of his life on fire. Restless evil, evil full of deadly poison. With the same tongue we praise God and curse people. This should not be. How often you find people who praise God with words, with songs, beautiful songs they sing, wonderful words, praise God, thank God, hallelujah. The same tongue they curse people. Cursing doesn't necessarily mean Using occult forces to put spells on people. Cursing means speaking bad of people. Speaking ill of people is cursing. Opposite of blessing. To bless people is to speak well of them. To curse people is to speak bad of them. With the same mouth, we praise God. We bless Him. Speak well of Him. And the same mouth, we curse people. James, this should not be. Now, one very discouraging part of that passage is, no man can tame the tongue. So you might ask me, brother, if I can't tame the tongue. What are you talking about? My tongue is a problem. It's restless evil, full of deadly poison. They won't say that, but they know the Bible says that. So how can I tame the tongue? Well, good news is, though we can't tame the tongue, God can tame the tongue. So how, do, how is the tongue tamed? Give your ear to the Lord. Your eye to the Lord and the mind to the Lord and your heart to the Lord. Over a period of time, all the garbage in the heart goes away and you start speaking words of edification or destruction. The same mouth that used to speak loose words should start speaking the very words of God. Solution is, Lord, my tongue is the problem. I'm going to give it to you, Lord. This is my weakness, Lord. God is such an amazing God. He will change our weakness and make it into strengths. Hebrews 11.34 He'll change our weakness and make it into a strength. Not just remove the weakness. Make the weakness into strength. You might say, my tongue is a weakness. You know, I'm not wise to know what to speak. When in a group, sometimes they say things I don't mean at all. There are some people like that, you know. Often I share the example. There are some people I know Nice people, nice Christians, but they're not wise enough to know what to speak and when to speak. In a group of people and they're sitting in a party or, or a get together, they're very quiet. Whenever they speak something, somebody gets hurt. They say something very innocently. 
Somebody in the group gets, oh, he hurt me by what he said. And then they stop talking. And why are you not talking to me? You hurt me. When did I hurt you? The day you said this. I never meant it. So there are some people who have the knack of saying the wrong thing to the wrong person at the wrong time in the wrong way. Wrong thing to the wrong person at the wrong time in the wrong way. They don't mean it. They just say something. Comes out of the mouth. Just like that. If somebody gets hurt. When they're done, they're told about it, they say, Oh, brother, this is my problem. I never meant to hurt anybody. But somehow, whenever I speak, somebody gets hurt. What to do? I'm praying. God should remove the weakness. Remove the weakness, they pray. Not to make it a strength. Remove weakness means what? Next time I'm in a group, I should keep quiet. Not say anything. Just keep quiet. One hour meeting, everybody's talking. I'm not talking anything. So I'm not talking. Nobody gets hurt. Think this is gone. Earlier has to hurt people. Now I'm, nobody's hurt because I don't say anything. God wants to change their weakness, make weakness and make it a strength. He wants to start speaking the very words of God. Words of edification. Don't just keep quiet. The same mouth that earlier spoke loose words, innocent words, sincere words, sincerely wrong words. Now start speaking words of edification. Speak the very words of God. Let me lead into one particular truth in the Bible, which you already must be knowing. To the Christians in, in the region of Pontus, Galatia, Capriosia, Asia, Britannia, Peter writes, 1 Peter 4.11, If anyone speaks, he should be the one speaking the very words of God. If anyone speaks, he must do it as the one speaking the very words of God. Anyone. Anyone in the church need not be an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor or a teacher. Any person in the church, the body of Christ, when he speaks, he or she must speak the very words of God. How wonderful. And God's word always blesses, always builds up people, always edifies, never pulls anyone down. So we speak words of edification, not destruction. So give your weakness of tongue to God and tell him, Lord, change my weakness and make it a strength. Don't just remove my weakness. Not that I should not hurt anybody anymore. Rather than hurting them, Lord, I don't want to hurt, but rather I want to build them up. Speak words to build them up in the faith. And every one of us can do that. You listen to God and you speak out. So what's the solution for that? Instead of listening to all gossip and slander, start listening to the Holy Spirit. Have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. He will teach you the word of God. He will give you the instructions of God. He will build you up. He's an encourager, comforter. He'll make a rise about difficulties. Encourager, comforter, one goes alongside. So every one of us who has the Holy Spirit living inside us, a believer, can be instruments of God in building up people, speaking words of edification. So give your tongue to the Lord by what you speak. Now the tongue also, the sense of taste also can be used for gluttony. Gluttony. I'm not talking about speaking now. I'm talking about the tongue. The tongue has a sense of, uh, it has taste buds. The taste buds can be actually leading you to gluttony. It's also a sin. Paul wrote about the Philippians about people who, <coughs> who's got the stomach. The God is the stomach. The mind is on earthly things. So sometimes what happens is in the, in the interest of eating good food, uh, we, go, we go beyond our, uh, what we should be eating and we, in a way, destroy our bodies. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You take care of our body. Please don't overeat. Don't overeat. Overeating or gluttony is a sin against God. Yes, we have good food around us. We all like good food. Uh, many, many of us are foodies. But then there's a limit. You have to have excess self-control. Okay, now I told you about the eye, the ear and the tongue. Now we must look to God, look to Him, read the scriptures, hear scriptures, speak scriptures. The question comes, brother, God gave us his five senses and uh, I can't be always reading the Bible. I have to be in the world so how can I use the five senses in a godly way? I'll tell you what we do, what I do. Don't follow me only in this area. 
with a sense of eyesight, they can appreciate God's creation. You know, I love uh, nature because nature is God created. No? And one of the best sights I've ever seen is early morning in the Himalayas. I used to go trekking those days in the Himalayas when I was a student. And early morning, when you uh, get up from bed in the tent, I went for a trek in the Garhwal Himalayas in Bageshwar, up 13,000 feet above sea level, from 30,000 from 30, feet. Early morning, when the sun rises, the sun's rays on the mountains, snow type mountains, a golden color. Snow is gold color. Gold, purple, and blue. I keep on watching that. God's creation with the eyes. We enjoy the creation of God. One of the best sights. I still remember when I was 22 years old. I enjoy that. And not only that, we were about uh, 4,000 feet above sea level at that particular point. And uh, below, uh, uh, in the valley, there was a river flowing. There's a valley, a river flowing. Nobody was there. We were only a few uh, trekkers. And a remote place in the Garhwal Himalayas. You see mountains early morning, Himalayas, golden color, snow-clad peaks. And early morning when you get up, you can hear the sound of the water trickling through the rocks. Three kilometers below, three kilometers below where we are, you can hear the water trickling. What a wonderful sight, uh, hearing it was. Listening to the crystal clear water flowing. That's God's creation. With our eyes, we can see God's creation and enjoy it. Enjoy it. Not only do we look into Jesus, the word of God reveals God, the word of God reveals God. Let me repeat that. The word of God reveals God's nature. The word of God reveals God's nature. Psalm 19 verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. We have read the poor of speech, night of night display knowledge. Creation of God reveals God's nature. And therefore, with the eyes, we can appreciate these things. We can appreciate the creation of God and not only look at Jesus and and uh, say, I read Bible only in the things I do. I, I like mountains. I like nature. Early morning, go to mountains. And uh, some people like the sea. Some people like mountains. But I, they're all created by God. Enjoy it. Number two, hearing. I love to listen to instrumental music. Now, I'm not a musician. You all know that. If I sing, you won't like it. But then I love to listen to music. Although they don't understand music. Music is wonderful in the ears. Including classical music. I don't know classical music. But I, I can appreciate classical music. You may not believe it. When I went to Salzburg way back, Salzburg is a hometown of a famous uh, composers. Mozart was born there. That region in Germany and Austria, the great composers were there. Mozart, Beethoven, Richard Wagner, Franz Josef Strauss, they're all born in that area. Salzburg, in the evening, you walk on the streets, every home you can hear piano being played. It's a culture there. In Salzburg, the culture is music. Remember the music, the song, the, the movie, Sound of Music? It was shot in Salzburg, the Sound of Music. They chose the right place to have uh, filmed this uh, movie called The Sound of Music. Salzburg is known for music, classical music. And I enjoyed walking in the streets of Salzburg after 7 o'clock in the night. Every house you can hear piano being played. Two instruments I like very much are violin and the piano. Both are very useful for worship. Piano is a wonderful instrument. And violin is a wonderful instrument. I can keep on listening. The modulation. Unlike you see, nowadays, we have keyboard, no? Uh, and the, the the when they play the piano, it, the sound slowly goes down. It's not electric uh, electric uh, uh, piano. It's a normal piano. And it's because they have a fels. Fels is a is a material between the uh, the keys. Fels, the best fels are manufactured in Germany. So with uh, with the years, you can listen to good music. With the eyes, we can see the creation of God, enjoy the creation of God. And with the mouth, we can enjoy food. Nothing wrong. I love good food. But eat till moderation. Don't overeat. Don't be like the Romans in those days. You know, Roman uh, uh, people, uh, the Roman generals those days, aristocracy, they used to really gluttons. They were, they were gluttons. We look at history of Rome. And next to the dining hall, they'll have a, what's called a vomitorium. You know the vomitorium? Vomitorium. They eat a lot of food, go next door and vomit, vomit everything. Again, go back and eat. Absolute gluttony. And uh, of course, we don't eat like that. We don't have vomitorians around us. But always eat till you have little space in the stomach. Don't eat to be full. 
and uh, we have must learn to exercise self control and eat just what we have to eat what is necessary for us when i was in russia i understood the how little we have to eat to be uh, uh, to just be have sustenance for three months i ate only potatoes boiled potatoes mashed potatoes roasted potatoes because i don't eat pork i don't eat beef and then i never had any other any other dish those days in siberia after two months i was so healthy never fell sick minus 45 degrees centigrade and i realized how little we have to eat to, to be healthy i never fell sick with that extreme cold never once had cold so eat to moderation and don't use your taste buds to go beyond and lose your uh, equilibrium what about the sense of smell of course we all know in a walk in a flower garden you enjoy the sense of uh, smell the rose garden any 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 flower you smell the flower you feel good who gave a sense of smell god gave you i think now and enjoying the sense of smell in a garden even grass i used to enjoy grass simple grass sit down on the grass and when i do my training for athletics those days after finishing all my training i get very tired i lie down on the grass and smell the grass smell the grass golfers who play golf often say when you are tired after playing golf smell the grass one more thing let me tell you with a sense of smell we can enjoy the uh, ozone in the beach in marina beach in, in chennai uh, we know all know that uh, oxygen is o2 o2 is oxygen water is h2o hydrogen and oxygen two atoms of hydrogen and one of oxygen h2o when you walk on the along the beach in marina when the waves lap over each other this oak oxygen is converted into o3 o2 becomes o3 what is o3 ozone ozone is o3 ozone smells wonderful ozone is very very refreshing again you go running early morning you run along beach elias beach to marina beach or four five kilometers along the beach in the water and smell the ozone have you noticed that when the waves hit the lap over each other at the shore oxygen made into o3 and uh, o3 is very nice to smell so the fact is god gave us sense of smell sense of taste sense of hearing can be used in a godly way also sense of touch how wonderful to hold a baby in your arms cuddling a baby is it wonderful the sense of touch the baby likes it one little baby when you give the hug the baby and to keep it close to your chest it's so wonderful when akshay was a small boy i used to enjoy uh, carrying him yeah, and he grew a little older also i was carrying him and i used to find it very difficult to carry him when he grew a little older as a child became little not a boy not a young boy but a child very very painful it used to be for me because my shoulder was dislocated but i used to enjoy holding him because he's my ch- my son and tiring to hold him but love to hold him because he is my son so holding a newborn baby or any baby for that matter is a wonderful sense of touch both for you and for the child they love to be cuddle babies isn't it so all the senses god has given us can be used in a godly way don't use it for a wrong way every faculty we have god gives us wisdom how to use the faculties god has given us in a way that pleases god so not only that we give the bible only and read the bible and only look to jesus nothing is important so what is the brother is one sided christian life this is always bible 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 i love the bible i enjoy the bible but i also read uh, you know i also look at my eyes i look at nature i love to go to the mountains I love waterfalls for example one of the best sights i saw was victoria falls in africa very very tall falls much better than niagara falls i've been to niagara also victoria falls is very rustic very rustic it's in the border of zambia uh, botswana and uh, zimbabwe the corner victoria falls so nature is a wonderful thing to look at and uh, take time off once in a way to enjoy nature so all the faculties god has given us can be used to appreciate the world of god and the word of god the world of god and the word of god and 
of a body as a living sacrifice to him. Don't let the faculties get caught up with the things in this world. He will only entice us with things of this world. But then say no to him. And the motivation to give our body living sacrifice is the mercy of God. In view of God's mercy, of your body is a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is a spiritual act of worship. Spiritual worship, not physical worship, not bowing down physically before God. Spiritual worship. Surrendering to Him and replacing your will with His will and enjoying doing His will. God wants all of us to be people who willingly, voluntarily offer every part of our body to Him. So not only all these things I mentioned of the body, even things that are not uh, uh, you know, physical, like the mind, give to him, heart, give to him. In uh, Joel 2.13, God says, render your heart, not your garments. So heart, mind, eyes, ears, mouth, tongue, all give to him. Early offer to the world, they will use that so he is the prince of this world. Now give to God and also enjoy the creation of God, the world of God. Both reveal God. Word of God reveals him. The world of God also reveals him. So let's pray that God give us wisdom that always we'll be people who uh, have the right motivation and every part of body we give to Jesus and keep our body clean because it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray.